Christmas. The only thing I don't like about Christmas is I don't like cold. I like the warm weather, but uh, if it's going to be, if Christmas is worth it to me. If you don't believe me, come check out my house. 438 McAlpin in Erlanger, if you want to write that down. Drive by and honk twice so I know you were there. Don't knock on my door, I probably won't answer it. I may, depends on who you are. 438 McAlpin, Erlanger. Drive by, honk twice. Everybody get that? If not, ask me later. I love it. I love the, the gifts. I love the Christmas cookies, love the parties. And I especially love those Christmas lights. Anybody been over to Coney Island yet? And amazing, amazing. And uh, me and Kara went down to uh, Lights Under Louisville last night. Uh, that was pretty awesome too. The Coney Island, spectacular show. Go up there and check it out. But don't ever forget the true meaning, and the reason for the season. So many people nowadays, the, the, y'all ever heard this? Don't, don't take Christ out of Christmas. Let me tell you what I think that means, okay? I don't think it's in a word or whether you say happy holidays or Merry Christmas. I think that's a feeling right here in your heart. Why are you celebrating Christmas? Why? Because I can tell you how many people I know that have said don't take Christ out of Christmas who are in church today or won't be in church on Christmas Eve night. Won't be worshiping God with all that they say or they do. Don't ever forget the reason for the season is Christ Jesus, our Lord, was born on that Christmas day. I need an amen to get this sermon started. Amen. And when we start really thinking about that, maybe you start realizing what a wonderful life that we have. Now, has anybody ever seen this movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Here's one of the most famous pictures for that. Now, we're going to talk about this movie a little bit today. And if you've never seen this movie, spoiler alert. But in the meantime, I don't feel bad. You've had 72 years to have seen it. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a little spoilers. Of course, you see up here, I don't know what the little girl's name is, but uh, it's Jimmy Stewart or James Stewart. He's the star of this, uh, this picture uh, as George Bailey. And, uh, his wife, Donna, is played by Donna Reed. The movie came out in 1946, and it was based on the short story called The Greatest Gift. I can hopefully you can start putting two and two together of where this sermon is going today. Now, the greatest gift is the, the short story. The movie is called It's a Wonderful Life. And really those two things can be synonymous. See, life can be absolutely awesome. It can be spectacularly wonderful. That, that feeling that, that you have when you're with your loved ones, when you're with your church family, when you're worshiping God, it can be awesome. But... Sometimes life can be discouraging too. Let's make no mistake about it. People get discouraged. Have you ever been discouraged? Every one of you can nod your head yes to that. Every single one of us know that in our lives sometimes we do get discouraged. Old George Bailey definitely got discouraged. Seemed like the whole world was crashing down on him. He had done so many good things. And as good as the movie is, the first two hours can be a little bit, you better not be tired. Right? You, you may just fall asleep. Uh, because he had done so many good things and now it was all crashing down. Everything, everything was ruined in his life. And, and what was it over? Business. Money. Scandal. He was maybe even facing jail time over something that was completely not his fault. And he was discouraged. And he didn't trust God. And he was heading down that wrong path real quick. And what about you? Have you ever been discouraged with some of these things? Money or stuff? It's that stuff. Our possessions. Those are so important to us, aren't they? And every one of us, we can say, no, it's not important to me. But it is a little bit, I promise you. And it, it, sometimes it's, it's real easy to say that my stuff, that my money, that my possessions aren't important to me when you have them. But it's when you, when you don't, they start taking them away. Maybe that's what might discourage you. Or maybe your health. Some of y'all have health problems. And that can most certainly be discouraging. Or what about relationships? 
These, these three things, money and health and relationship, are the root, I believe, of all discouragement that we have in, in our lives. Sometimes things that we can't control, and, and there'll be these kind of things that we can't control. Discouragement comes when things are not going your way. And everybody likes to get their way, don't they? But when we don't get our way, man, it's discouraging. But what did God say about discouragement? Look at Joshua. He said, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. He is with us wherever we go. God tells us flat out, don't be discouraged in your life. And it's easier, easier said than done for us sometimes. But when we really trust Him and we really start to rely on the power of prayer, I believe that discouragement can be squashed. And what about this power of prayer? It's definitely something that we need to plug into. Don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. If prayer has affected you in your life, say amen to me right now. We have a praying church. I can testify to that. You all have prayed for me, and I can tell you, I've, I've felt it. And I promise you this, I've prayed for you as well. We pray for each other. That's what church family does. And that's what we will continue to do. We've seen answered prayers. And let's, let's talk about that, though. Because all of our prayers have been answered. All of them has, have been answered. But we've, we've seen specifically answered prayers where the answer has been yes to our request here in our own church, our church family. Well, the movie It's a Wonderful Life starts. Remember how it starts? With prayers. Amen. With prayers being lifted up to God in heaven. From others for George. We call this prayers of intercession. Intercession basically, basically means you're praying on behalf of someone else. Now, as Christians, we do this, don't we? We should be doing it. We should be praying for, for others, for each other, like we just talked about. But let me ask you this, and this is, I hope, that, I hope this touches your heart right now. Have any, have any of you ever had someone come and say, I need you to pray for me, or I've got this problem, and you've said these words, I'll pray for you. And then you never did. I think we, we're all guilty of that at some point. I'm just saying, I'll pray for you. Oh, you, you, you've got some health issues, or you've got some relationship issues, I'll, you'll be in my prayers. But then we didn't do it. Did we? See, this is, this is what I think we have to do. It's, it's, our, it's important that we remember when we say we're going to pray for someone, we do. And sometimes people tell you stuff real quick in passing, and you know what we have to do? We have to pray for them right then. Even if it's just silently, you know, even if it's just an immediate reaction for us to say, Lord, please be with whoever. Even if it's just in our own minds, don't, don't wait till later because you may forget. I've told you before, I'm very forgetful. I promise you this. If you tell me something really important right now today and when the service is over and I'm talking to about 20 or 30 of you, forget about it. I'm not going to remember. You're going to have to write it down and hand it to me. I'm, just, I'm awful with that kind of stuff. Better yet, write it down and hand it to my mom. <laughs> that's, that's a better chance that I won't lose that piece of paper. I, all week long, I wrote down announcements that I was going to make sure to say on Sunday morning. And guess what? I don't know where that paper's at. So hopefully I didn't forget anything. Don't just say it. Actually do it. Don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. But what did George also do in that movie? He also prayed for himself. And he had an answer to his prayer. So when we pray, God hears more than we say. He answers more than we ask. And he gives us more than we can imagine in his own time and in his own way. In the book of Romans, it tells us that he understands even the, the mutters, the murmurs from our heart that we don't even voice through our prayers. God most certainly answers our prayers. I promise you, you've not had one prayer that's not been answered. But maybe you just didn't like the answer. We've learned this before. I learned this here from Dad many, many years ago. God always answers prayers. Either yes, no, or maybe later. It's hard for us, though, isn't it, sometimes to understand. Sometimes that yes answer is really obvious. And sometimes that no is hard to accept. And then maybe later we want things now on our time, on our terms. But we have to trust God. 
We might not always understand, especially if it's not like we wanted, but God does answer your prayers. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. Gotta love this verse. It says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, do what? Pray about everything. Say that with me. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. It goes on to say, Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand, that peace that passes understanding. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Pray about everything. Thank Him for all He has done. When you do this, you're going to have a peace that passes understanding. What it all boils down to is trust God. Now, folks, that's really easy for us to say, isn't it? But what does that even mean? How many of y'all, and you know what, I, you can just raise your hand right now. How many of y'all worried about something today? How many of y'all worried about something this past week or this past year? See, part of trusting God is to cast all our cares upon Him, to not worry about tomorrow when we don't know what today may bring. And again, that's really, really hard. I'm not saying not to be prepared. I'm talking about genuine anxiety with worry. I've experienced it. Trying to make sure I got all the Christmas gifts right. Trying to make sure I don't spend too much money on Christmas lights instead of Christmas presents. Don't laugh. That's a real issue for me. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to make sure we do all the things we're supposed to do. Trying to make sure I'm prepared for all the things we have going on here at church. It's a busy, it's a busy season. It's hard not to worry about life. But guys, when we really trust God, we have nothing to worry about. Nothing. George didn't trust God. He decided to take matters into his own hands. He found out that he had an insurance policy. It was worth more than he owed. That was going to cause him trouble, right? Money situation. And he thought, I'm worth more dead than I am alive. All my problems can be, can be solved. And he went up to that bridge. And he was going to jump off into that cold, icy river. Enter old Clarence, the angel. And he had a chance uh, to give George in this movie a chance to what would life be without him? The what if scenario. You know, I like these what if type scenarios. What if something was different? What if? Well, in the movie, we find out that George is going to find out what the world would be like without him. So let me ask you, what would the world be like without you? In ministry, I think Dad probably taught me this one too, and a lot of preachers will tell you, don't ever tell a story and make yourself the hero and don't do it too regular because it's not about you and all that. And the last thing I want to do is tell you all to be like me because quite honestly, I got a lot of work to do on myself. Let's just be straight and simple about that, right? But however, today I'm going to tell you a story where I'm a hero, so pay attention. <laughs> Many years ago, I think I was 19 or 20 years old, this trip, uh, this church took a trip uh, with our puppet team, our youth, to Hanging Rock Christian Camp. Some of y'all was there. I know Geneva was there and Sarah was there. A few others were there. Richard was definitely there that day. Uh, we went to this camp and um, there was a creek. And we took all the kids from that church camp that year. And of course, I'm in Bible college at the time, and, uh, uh, but they're representing our church. We took the kids on this uh, trail, which kind of like ran next to this creek. And at the end, underneath this big hanging rock, uh, where the church camp got its name, was kind of a pool. Um, now, this creek was running pretty good that day, but the kids got right in there to, to swim just a little bit. And um, we're getting ready to turn. I'm helping some of the kids go up the hill. And all of a sudden, I hear, help me, Mikey, help me, help me. And I turn around, and here's a little boy who I just met this week, flailing his arms in complete panic. You see, that stream took him, it carried the, the current, took him out underneath that rock, which was where it was very deep and a very strong current. And what are you going to do? What are you going to do? So I reacted. I handed my buddy my wallet. I jumped in the water with my shoes on. And I swam out there and, and, and helped this kid. And it was, it was tough. It was tough water. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm a strong swimmer. And I, I had a hard time that day. And I got him back to the shore. And about this time, there was a little girl who had been out there trying to help him back up the water, trying to help me out. And I get him up in the water. And next thing I know is, Mikey, help! Mikey, help! I turn around and she had drifted out there as well. And just, the, you know, it still bothers me, the look of sheer terror 
on these kids' faces. They swam out there and got her and pulled her back in. What if I wasn't there that day? Maybe nothing. Maybe, maybe someone else would have jumped in. What if? I think about that trip because I, I think about Richard Nixon. And I know you all know Richard back working with our kids today. And if you ever tell anybody else his name, it's really funny. <laughs> like, really? Richard Nixon? Yeah, really. Anyways, I, some of you all are going to remember this too. Many years ago, probably 10 years before the story I just told you, Richard was on the news. Did you all know that? Because there was a house up the street from him that was burning down. And there was three kids that were left inside by their parents. And Richard ran into that house and pulled those kids out. You all remember that? And he had this big, ugly beard at the time. And it was all like singed. I don't, it's never grown back right since. That's why he didn't have a beard to this day. I don't think he could grow it. And, and I remember his line. Like they asked him, like, why did you do that? He said, there's kids in there. That's what he said on the news that night. And I'm proud of him for that still to this day. What if he hadn't been there that day? What if? Just you react in situations like that. Well, in the movie It's a Wonderful Life, we know that George saved his brother from that icy water. Of course, it caused him to use, lose hearing in his, I think, right ear. And his brother went on to serve in the movie in World War II, and of course, he was able to save a, a whole ship full of men. You see how this is going now. What if? What if? Here's a more important thing, I think, for our lives. You just never know. And the impact that you make, I promise you, is greater than you think it is. Especially the impact that you can make with your faith. With your faith. Now, the stories I told you, those, those are true stories, except the one about the movie, of course. That's completely fake. But you know what's probably more important than that? Is telling people about Jesus. Amen. Are you making an impact with your faith? I don't even want to know necessarily about who you might have saved the life of yesterday. And maybe you did. Maybe it was defensive driving going up the highway. Traffic's horrible right now, if you all didn't know that. And I think every day I probably save someone's life by using some defensive driving. Or maybe someone else saves my life by defensive driving against me. I don't know. But the greatest impact that you can have is to believe in Jesus Christ, to share your faith, and to live it daily. Amen. Believing is an action word. It takes more, like how I said, than just saying, I believe. What are you doing in your life to make an impact with your faith? Romans 1.8 says, Your faith in God is becoming known throughout the world. How I thank God through Jesus Christ for each one of you. Our responsibility as a church, as a church family. I want to kind of I, I want to have the kind of faith here and make the kind of impact here where it's become known throughout the world. Or at least throughout Latonia. And I think that we are. But man, we've still got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of people out there right now that aren't in church today. There's a lot of people out there right now that don't understand what it means to keep Christ in Christmas. And there's a lot of people right there, out there right now who are saying keep Christ in Christmas and have no idea what they're talking about. Because they don't know who Jesus Christ truly is. He's not a baby in a manger. He grew up in a perfect man. And the perfect sacrifice for you and for me. We have a responsibility now to be his body, to be the body of Christ, to just be the church. Church, I need you with me on this. There's eternal ramifications on the line. Now imagine now, though, since we've said a world without us, with you, me, what if there was a world without Jesus? We'd be lost. We'd be lost. And we can say now that the world is lost. Maybe we're losing the world. But I got good news for y'all. And it started that day that Christ was born. We win. We will win this battle. The church will be victorious. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when will this happen. And nobody knows. Not even the Son of Man knows.
What about a world without Jesus at the sad state of affairs? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, the second part says, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead, He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. Rescued us. So what if we didn't have Jesus? Folks, we wouldn't be rescued. But thankfully we are. We're thankful that we have Him, that He has rescued us, and that He is always with us. Always. Don't be discouraged, for I am with you always. That's a great promise that we have. Matthew 28, 20 says this. It says, teach the new, these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even till the end of the age. Now, I love how he says this part right before. And be sure of this. In other words, pay special attention to this. Jesus was, and he's saying here, do not forget this next part that I'm telling you. I'm with you always. Not just on Christmas, not just on Easter, not just on New Year's, not just on Thanksgiving, not just on Sunday mornings, not just at Latonia Christian Church. Always. Amen. Amen. I'm blessed by that. <laughs> so George learned his lesson. And then the most classic moment, according to the MGM Top 100 Classic Moments of TV History, we find out this next line. Every time a bell rings, Angel gets his wings. And Clarence is going to get his wings at the end of that because George is going to see what life would have been like without him. And he's going to come to the realization real quick that he has a blessed life, that he has a reason to rejoice. Now, I'm just, again, I don't want to spoil anything for you guys. But every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That is not scripture, all right? <laughs> that, is not, that is not for real. But I, I can tell you, though, every time a bell rings, we should rejoice. And any time a bell doesn't ring, we should rejoice. Because we've got to rejoice no matter what in all circumstances. In life, just like the angels do for you. Because this is is scripture Luke 15 10 in the same way there's joy in the presence of God's angels even when one sinner repents think about that anytime we've had someone come down this aisle and say I believe in Jesus Christ I'm repenting of my sins I want to give my life to him we rejoice right here as a church family don't we they're rejoicing in heaven too and that's what the Bible says it's bell ringing, though. I love doing that with the kids earlier. That's announcing something, isn't it? It's announcing that, that great news that we have. That Jesus Christ not only is born, but that he lived and died for you, for me. So what do the angels do when we look into the scripture? They brought good news. And when we, when we talk about the Christmas story, we can, we can say, here, they came and told Zechariah. Of the good news. They came and told Mary. They came and told Joseph. They came and told those shepherds up on that hill. And those angels that bring those good news, they don't look like Clarence, I don't think. Because would you be afraid of Clarence? And what's the thing that the angel always says in the scripture? Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because why? Because every time you see an angel in the scripture, and if you saw one right now, you would be afraid. And that's what he told Zechariah and Mary and Joseph. And that's what they told the shepherds when they stood on the hill that night. Remember the shepherds, they were sore afraid. So what are we going to say about this bell, though, this good, this good news? When the bell rings, go and tell it. Go and spread that good news. So the angels did that night. They sang, Hallelujah, Christ is born. And that's another responsibility that we have as a church, as a church family, and as individual Christians. Not just to pray, not just to pray for each other, but to also tell people why we do. It's not even just a, a responsibility. It's a command. Mark 16, 15 said, Jesus told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. And what, did, what happened whenever the shepherds told people that night? They were excited. 
They couldn't wait to tell people. Are you excited to tell people about Jesus? Are you excited to tell them why you believe in Jesus? Are you excited to tell them the many, many, many reasons why? See, and I know I say this all the time. I'm going to continue to say it because it just means so much to me. But we've got reasons and we need to count them. We've got to count our blessings. Think of all those reasons. And when you're down and out and things are tough in your life, count your blessings. But now let me say something else because I think that's like the direction I've gone in every time we talk about this. When things are great in your life, when it just seems like, man, I'm on top of the world, count your blessings. Not, not just on Thanksgiving and not just on Christmas, but doggone it, people, all year long, we better remember all the good things that God has given us. Most importantly, the best gift of all time. And what is that? The gift of life. Now make, make no mistake, we, we say that Jesus is the best gift of all time. But what does that mean to us? Life. What has God given to us? The greatest gift, life. He created us. He sent Jesus to earth for us. The very world that He created, God sent His only Son. Forgiveness and eternal life. Think about, I want you to think about this. Without Christmas, there is no Easter. Without Christmas, there is no sacrifice. Without Christmas, there is no resurrection. Without Christmas, there is no forgiveness. Without Christmas, there is no eternal life in heaven with God. So I say take advantage of it. Let this be your wake-up call today. Old George got a wake-up call for sure. Whenever he found out all the people that loved him. And I believe one of the last things in the movie that you would see is a letter that, that George gets from Clarence. And I think it says, No man is a failure if he only has friends. Ladies and gentlemen, you have friends here in this church, in this church family, but none of them are as good as your best friend, that first Christmas gift, Jesus. You have a friend indeed. Let this be your wake-up call today. We have opportunities abundant this time of year and all year long. Rejoice with those opportunities. Take advantage of those opportunities. Rejoice in those opportunities to serve Him. If you haven't done this yet, accept Him. And ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake about it. With Christ, we indeed have a wonderful life. And a wonderful eternal life. Would you please pray with me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this wonderful life, this gift that you have given us. Help us to take advantage of the opportunities we have to worship you in everything that we say and do, in every way, in our actions, and our attitudes. Lord, help us to represent your Son, Jesus, our Savior. The best gift of all time. The gift that keeps on giving, Lord, the gift of life. We thank you for this wonderful life. And in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Because we know that he lives today and forevermore. Amen. Amen.